So it is a pleasure this evening to have Dr. Austin Baraki on the show. Thanks so much for taking time out of what I can only imagine is quite a hectic schedule and talking to me this evening, Austin. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure. So you've a very diverse background and maybe if you'd like to give us a brief synopsis of maybe kind of all the roles you're currently juggling at and what your main interest and area of focus is at the moment. Um, recently completed residency and I'm in between jobs. I'll be picking up um, an academic hospital medicine position uh, within the next month um, where I'll be taking care of medical inpatients, supervising residents, things like that. Um, I also uh, do some telemedicine uh, co- um, consults and, and practice with folks. Um, I also have a busy barbell coaching practice, online programming. I coach people from the novice stage all the way up to elite international level lifters. Um, and um, collaborate with my uh, with my buddy uh, Jordan, Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum, who I think you may have talked to mm, before. Yeah. Um, at uh, at Marvel Medicine, where we are regularly putting out content, educational stuff. Um, you know, so so all, all sorts of stuff. Uh, staying super busy all the time. Yeah, a good way to be. And I can only imagine your schedule is a nightmare. So, hands in a lot of pies, as we say. So we'll try and get straight into it this evening, and not waste time. And The first area I want to talk about is you've recently wrote a paper for the journal Up to Date, which is um, a journal for medical professionals to keep them up to date with latest research and around the idea of implementing strength training in adults, in healthy adults and for the prevention and also within special disease populations. So I think the evidence is really starting to gather obviously it's well established for physical activity but for strength training and resistance training in particular we're seeing the literature continually growing for its benefits what do you think are maybe some of the the major misconceptions that are still held out there towards strength training for health purposes that maybe is limiting why we're not seeing it applied right across the board or prescribed more heavily across the board misconceptions both on the professional side among physicians because I see them among my colleagues uh, pretty often and their misconceptions among patients of course among Mm -hmm. like the lay public so to speak and so you know the article that we wrote um, was talking about the implementation and benefits and risks of resistance training in adults not just healthy adults but also in the context of uh, common health problems comorbidities things like that Uh, and so in the health community I think the, probably the biggest misconception out there is that the evidence doesn't exist or that there mm. isn't enough, there isn't data on this stuff. That was actually one of the first reactions I heard uh, when, when I, had, so I, had a, I had a colleague who's also a physician who was talking to a cardiologist about the article that we were publishing. And he was like, well, that all sounds great, but there's really no data on this stuff. <laughs> and he said that just really flippantly, and, and that's primarily because you know, it's not necessarily like a centerpiece in like official cardiology society guidelines because that's where everybody goes to kind of for their, you know, to, to get an understanding of, of uh, you know, first line management of common disease states. And so because they're not featured very prominently and taught and discussed and encouraged in fellowship training programs and stuff like that, he's just like, oh, I don't know about it. So there's no data on this stuff. And so that uh, irritated me a little bit uh, because I had just finished pouring through the literature. I found a rather large number of studies discussing resistance training in you know acute cardiac rehab, even starting uh, you know cardiac rehab after acute uh, MI or, or after heart attacks. Talking about resistance training in the setting of heart failure, which is probably one of the more counterintuitive ones for mm. physicians when they think about the physiology of heart failure and blood pressure changes uh, and things like that. Um, talking about peripheral vascular disease um, uh, and all, basically all sorts of uh, cardiovascular conditions, among many other systems-based illnesses. So I also went into things like COPD and chronic kidney disease and liver disease and stroke. And and there's you know I was able to find literature and data on all these things. And of course, it's a variable quality as the data is in just about any research field. And the interventions that are used in these studies are highly variable. Uh, meaning, you know, some are low intensity interventions, some are high intensity interventions. They use different ways of delivering the resistance. So it's like, you know, of course, my bias, you know, I train and compete in powerlifting and coach lifters is is for barbell training, but there's relatively few barbell-based training studies. One really interesting one of note from 2017 is the Liftmore trial uh, for 
osteoporosis, um, where they studied a bunch of like 65 plus year old women, a quarter of whom who had had a fracture before, and they put them under a barbell and had them squatting and pressing and deadlifting. That's like a unicorn of a study for us <laughs> to be to, to have available to us. Um, but you know, we have to do the best we can with the rest of the data we have, and, and there are lots of different ways to resistance train. There are lots of ways to get people stronger. And, you know, just in condition after condition after condition, the, the evidence is piling up that there's benefits on quality of life, on function, on, uh, you know, mortality, all these things that we see improving. And so the idea that that big misconception in the medical field that the evidence doesn't exist, like if I went to a rheumatologist and said, what do you think about resistance training in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis? They would say, you know, probably that they're not familiar with it or in the context of osteo osteoarthritis. And they might say, oh, that might be bad for the joints or something like mm. that. Because they're unfamiliar with the with the evidence that does exist, um, and so that's kind of the biggest one that I that we are hoping to with this with this uh, article. There's actually two articles that we're getting published in, in up today. We're hoping to help dispel to the extent that we can get people to spread this information, is so that you know healthcare professionals can be like, oh, you know, uh, you know, because we have this big audience of, of people who are many of whom are patients, and they might be able to take this information to their doctors and and help to spread that stuff as well. So the more doctors and healthcare professionals we can get to just be aware of this stuff in the first place, then we can start to kind of get our foot in the door and get it to be more widely prescribed. And is there a certain degree of a lack of education on the actual execution of this within healthcare professionals? Because it's very easy to instruct someone to go for a walk or go for a run or a swim. But sure. if you instruct someone, oh, you should start doing resistance exercise and the patient turns around, well, what should I do? It's it's a much yes. more complex thing if I'm just playing devil's advocate for the doctor to prescribe if yes. they're uneducated in the kind of mechanisms of programming or basic resistance training. That is an excellent point, uh, and I completely agree. There's no training on this whatsoever in, in medical school, um, and so there's a few pieces to this. So so one for sure is that they're not going to be able they're, they're not going to be comfortable providing specific prescription most of the time, which is why the second article that should be getting published sometime soon is practical implementation of resistance training in adults. And so that's where we talk about mechanisms uh, of benefit and we talk about how to actually we lay out a few sample like programs that you can give. So if you have somebody who's interested in like, you know, free weights, there's like a dumbbell program, there's like a leg press, you know, and component there's barbell-based program that we included there, and we discuss all the other modalities as well as their mm -hmm. pros and their cons, you know, because some people are going to be like, what about resistance bands? And, of course, our opinion is like, well, that's not a very trainable thing, like, for long-term mm -hmm. progress, but if that's all I can get the patient to start doing now, um, and the alternative is that they sit on their couch and they consider that their daily walk to the mailbox is enough exercise, well, then I can get my foot in the door that way and mm -hmm. get it started with something. So, so that's how we're hoping to deliver some of this information. Now, I'm still under no illusion that uh, the physicians who would be able to see this are necessarily automatically going to start putting it into their practice and routinely prescribing this, mainly because of uh, practical considerations in the context of a clinical appointment. Like if you're in the outpatient setting and you have, you know, if you're lucky, you have 20 minutes to have an appointment with a patient. A lot of times it's short and the patient may have, you know, a problem with five different organ systems that you have to address, do their medication refills, cancer screenings. Uh, you know, discuss a whole bunch of other things that are more important to the patient than what you think is most important for them. So that's a practical uh, issue. And so that's the same thing we run into um, with, uh, for example, uh, things like dietary and nutritional counseling. You know, a lot of physicians are neither comfortable with this, not educated enough on this stuff, and they don't have time to go into it very much. And so the, the, the solution that has emerged uh, in kind of clinical practice now is greater utilization of, um, of, uh, of multidisciplinary specialists. In other words, in your clinic, if you, if you fortunately, if you're lucky enough to have the resources, you may have a dietitian in the clinic. You may have a diabetic educator in the clinic. You may have a pharmacist in the clinic. So for example, if I have a patient who has newly diagnosed diabetes, they're not very well controlled and I need to prescribe them, you know, some dietary modification. I need to uh, prescribe them a medicine that requires like an injection um, and, uh, and I want to prescribe them exercise, for example. It's hard to go through all that stuff myself in detail during the course of one appointment, and so that's why these multidisciplinary multi teams are becoming more popular because it, it makes better use of everyone's skills. Um, you know, if the physician yeah. can oversee the care, the dietitian can do dietary counseling, the pharmacist can teach the injection technique or a nurse can teach the injection technique, and if we have some sort of a... You know, the, the idea would be if we have some sort of, uh, you know, uh, physical 
exercise prescription specialists that we could refer to in the mm-hmm. clinical setting. Of course, those are difficult to come by, and a lot of them, you know, a lot of it ends up being deferred to like physical therapy, which which is not ideal for this stuff a lot of times. Um, but that's kind of what I foresee in the future will probably need to happen is to use multidisciplinary specialists to do this stuff. A hundred percent, and that obviously is ideal because I think it can be very easy sometimes for maybe less informed people or certain trainers or coaches to kind of somewhat belittle or hate on the work of doctors kind of say oh well they know nothing about exercise nutrition but at the end that's not what they're trained to do that's not what their primary role is so i think that's kind of a very naive approach to go on that not saying that we shouldn't improve the education but that is um, not the correct thing to kind of belittle all the education and high degree of work that they do um within that paper and you alluded to it earlier on there is some conditions where we see good evidence for benefit benefits of resistance training that as you said are somewhat counterproductive or people have long held a bias against so for example heart disease hypertension chronic kidney disease these kind of areas where it'd be very easy to think well if i do resistance training of some degree that could actually um lead to detrimental effects within those conditions but through increased pressure or increased uh, metabolite metabolism for the kidneys, that kind of thing. So have you any comment on maybe the mechanisms of why resistance training doesn't seem to do what we logically think it may do in these situations? Yeah, so this is a super interesting kind of uh, area. And it's something that I think in the long term, uh, Jordan and I through Barbell Medicine are probably going to plan to create some online educational content um, that we can get like with CMEs and to, to try to spread this stuff even more uh, through the healthcare professionals community so that they can be aware of this data even more than just saying here's this one article read it which most mm. people don't read when you send them things to read right so so um, you know let's take blood pressure for example so so you know long it, it, it's I think everybody is well aware of the idea that your acute blood pressure is going to rise under heavy resistance training. Everybody's felt that, they've seen it in somebody's face when they're deadlifting a PR weight, right? Your veins <laughs> fold, your eyes stick out, all kinds of crazy stuff. So your acute blood pressure definitely rises during that setting. So people extrapolate that and they assume that it's gonna make your chronic resting blood pressure rise, which does not appear to be the case. Uh, fortunately, our vascular system is comprised, I mean, all of our arteries have smooth muscle in their walls, they're adaptable structures, just like our heart contractility, muscle thickness, things like that in your heart adapt to the chronic workload of, imposed upon them, uh, both uh, productively and in a maladaptive fashion in, in, in some situations, like in chronic hypertension. And so, for example, in just regular blood pressure, uh, uh, hypertension, uh, it's thought that uh, you know chronic resistance training actually helps to uh, improve the vasodilatory capacity of like your capillary beds. In other words, they are better able to tolerate these blood pressure fluctuations. They're able to dilate to preserve blood flow in the setting of, you know, really elevated blood pressures. And so, you know, on, on average, uh, your resting blood pressure tends to decrease with chronic resistance training. Uh, in the setting of, of heart failure, heart failure is one that I find particularly interesting, mm-hmm. uh, mainly because of the way it's taught in medical school. It's taught that, you know, all the symptoms that you get from heart failure are because of this congestion that you get, the fluid congesting in your lung. That's why it's called congestive heart failure. But it turns out that the symptoms that people get from congestive heart failure are quite a bit more complicated than that. Um, heart failure is not just a, a condition that affects the heart. It becomes kind of a chronic uh, a systemic disease insofar as there are a bunch of hormonal changes. We call them like neurohormonal changes that influence multiple organs uh, throughout the body, including your uh, skeletal muscle. And so... Um, I cited some uh, some evidence there that suggests that basically heart failure in the long term, uh, people are well aware that, for example, in the end stages of heart failure, you know, people become cachectic, yeah. and we oftentimes refer these patients for hospice, and that's because there's a muscle wasting syndrome associated with chronic heart failure, um, and it's multifactorial, very very complex, and so the symptoms that people sometimes get of you know exercise uh, 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 exertional intolerance, they can't really do very much is not exclusively due to you know pulmonary congestion, but it's also due to the fact that their muscles are not working as well as they should be. And so what is our treatment or what is our, you know, how can we best attack that pathophysiology is to get them to train hmm. uh, to, to improve uh, the, the function of their skeletal muscle. And there are studies even up to high intensities, which are super counterintuitive in heart failure because your blood pressure rises and you would think, have your failing heart have to work that much harder against it but there's I cited multiple studies of uh, high intensity or just 
was training upwards of eight, and uh, and there was no evidence bad for events in terms of like arrhythmia, sudden cardiac death, uh, decompensated heart failure, or things like that in these studies. Um, COPD is another one where COPD has a cr- complex, chronic, systemic, inflammatory um, pathophysiology going on, and those patients are also oftentimes treated for their COPD with corticosteroids like prednisone. They have chronic hypoxemia. Their oxygen levels might be low chronically. All that stuff is toxic to your skeletal muscle. So COPD, another condition, and it's end stages. Patients get cachectic. We refer them to hospice. You know, they might be on oxygen at home, things like that. And so to the extent that we can improve their skeletal muscle function, we can improve their overall function, their quality of life, things like that. Um, so that's another condition where you can attack the pathophysiology with, uh, with, with resistance training. And the last one I'll mention as well, well, I guess you mentioned chronic kidney disease. And all of these, there, there's a pattern or a theme that people may notice going through the article is that a lot of these, uh, you know, modern diseases that we deal with a lot are these chronic uh, inflammatory states. So chronic mm-hmm. kidney disease is a chronic, very much a chronic inflammatory state. They're, all the autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, things like that, are chronic inflammatory states. Uh, heart failure has a chronic inflammatory component. Diabetes, metabolic mm-hmm. syndrome, chronic liver disease, all have chronic inflammatory states. And so uh, if you look at kind of the mechanisms, for example, if you want to oversimplify it for a second and look at mechanisms of muscular hypertrophy, um, there's uh, there's an interest there's a very very good multiple uh, good papers on this that basically lay out um, you know the, the molecular pathways of muscular hypertrophy. Uh, I think one of them is by a guy named like Hoppler or something like that. I can send it to you and mm. you can put it in the in the show notes for people yeah. who are interested in this stuff. But it shows you know you have your your IP your um, your mTOR pathway, your satellite cell pathway, your um, you know uh, mechanotransduction stuff. And then on the muscular atrophy side of things, or the pathways that inhibit mTOR and muscular hypertrophy, you have things like TNF-alpha, which is an inflammatory mediator. Um, you have like alcohol, or like you know chronic alcoholism, stuff like that. So you have all these other things that can influence these pathways. And so TNF-alpha, for example, this inflammatory cytokine, directly inhibits uh, you know muscular hypertrophy. So that's why in all these chronic inflammatory states, obviously it's more complex than this, but in these chronic inflammatory states, you see things like muscle wasting. So heart failure patients get cachectic, chronic liver disease patients get cachectic, chronic kidney disease patients, you know, at the end of life on dialysis, they get cachectic, Uh, rheumatoid cachexia is a thing, cancer patients get cachectic. So all these things um, that they're kind of the, that they have diverse pathophysiologies, but the common denominator in many of them is this chronic inflammation that impairs muscle function, that results in muscle wasting, which then reduces quality of life and increases mortality. That's probably the best I should sum it up. Yeah. And so the best way we have to attack the common pathophysiology here, of course, cancer needs to be treated one way, heart failure needs to be treated another way, diabetes needs to be treated a different way. But the chronic inflammatory situation that you have going on, the muscle, the impaired muscle function, it's been described as like an intrinsic myopathy. The muscles are, are not functioning normally and they're wasting away is to get people to train. Um, and of course, it's not easy, particularly in patients who, have, who are symptomatic with, with exertion or with exercise. And so the dose needs to be titrated very carefully. They need to be introduced to it in a way um, that they can tolerate, that's not threatening to them, that they're not fearful of, that they're going to adhere to, things like that. So it all gets really complex really quickly. But that's kind of how a lot of these conditions that have this kind of like, you know, this, this benefit from resistance training that most physicians are completely unaware of and would never make them think to prescribe resistance training. Like rheumatoid arthritis, oh, my joints hurt. Yeah, go lift weights. <laughs> I sound crazy saying that, but I have all this evidence supporting that it's going to improve your function, your quality of life, things like that. Yeah, 100%. And one of the things you mentioned there, and I'll just bring it up because for some reason when we mentioned the word cancer people automatically have a different kind of opinion or a different reaction compared to any other disease and do the same recommendations apply for cancer patients so uh in general i would say yes uh in the setting of people who have uh uh things like bony metastases so so tumors that have spread into bone i have to be uh, just obviously from a from a uh, you know medico legal standpoint, I have to be very cautious with prescribing resistance training in that setting. Although I recently had a paper sent to me on a patient on, on a study of patients who had spinal bony metastases and they had a resistance training and they were doing fine, which is amazing that yeah. that got through an IRB. But yeah. um, so bony metastases would be a situation of concern. And then the other one that would be of concern is probably patients who have intracranial metastases, so so tumors in their brain that have the potential to increase intracranial pressure. 
that's just something where, mm-hmm. again, from a cautionary standpoint, while in a public forum, I have to say, you know, you yeah. need to be, uh, be concerned in that situation. Um, but, but yeah, otherwise, uh, you know, the majority of, of cancer states, I see, you know, there's evidence on benefit and not really contraindicated either. So. That's perfect. And in terms of, we just go outside cancer in a general uh, closing statement on it. It can be very easy for your powerlifter. I'm a powerlifter and a coach as well that we can fall into our own bias of everyone should resistance train. When we draw back a bit, are there any contraindications or any context outside of the 2D just mentioned where maybe we shouldn't weight train or we need very special considerations on balance the risk to reward ratio for that condition? Yes. So risk reward, there's cost and benefit to every intervention that we can possibly do to a person. Uh, and so they always merit consideration. In the overwhelming majority of situations, uh, the benefits outweigh the risks. There are some situations where we don't have enough evidence, for example, in patients with um, with enlarging abdominal aortic aneurysms or thoracic aortic aneurysms. Those would be situations where I would be you know, very hesitant to tell somebody mm-hmm. to go lift weights, mainly because I don't have the benefit of a lot of evidence telling me that it's going to be safe. And if you go and you know, your AAA, you know, ruptures while you're in the gym and you don't get to the ER in time, uh, you could be dead in under an hour. You know? yeah. So, so uh, that's a situation where, you know, the risks, it, we, we have this situation where the theoretical risks are very high and the benefits are unknown. And so that's what tilts our decision-making process there, right? Mm. So most of these other situations, the risks we know are fairly low because of our evidence on the stuff showing low rates of adverse events and the benefits are very high. Here's one where the theoretical risks are real high, the benefits are unknown. Um, other situations, and these are things I discussed in the article, is in like the setting of coronary uh, coronary heart disease. Um, it's well known, you know, although the absolute incidence of cardiovascular events during and post exercise is low, exercise itself increases those uh, those risks in absolute terms. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, it's very small, but that risk elevation is there, and so. If somebody has what will, you know some symptoms uh, like worsening angina during exercise, worsening chest pain during exercise, stuff like that, that obviously be a situation where somebody needs to get evaluated much more urgently. And strength training is lower on their priority list compared mm-hmm. to surviving. Um, but again, even in patients with known heart disease, uh, the benefit is still there, uh, and so that's why there's resistance training that's being performed in uh, you know cardiac rehab. Um, after uh, after acute MI and even in patients with stable chronic angina, um, there's uh, you know they can they can do okay with it. So so heart disease is one that merits some special consideration. Mm. Uh, another one is in diabetics. Um, I discussed a lot of the considerations in diabetes relating to blood sugar management, so they don't end up getting hypoglycemic during exercise. Uh, patients with known diabetic retinopathy, so uh, abnormal proliferation of blood vessels in the retina in the back of the eyes. Sometimes that can result in uh, acute hemorrhage um, and, and can obviously affect their vision, things like that. Uh, the risk of vitreous hemorrhage definitely increases in the setting of uh, really almost any exertion. That was the that was one surprising finding to me is like there's not really a blood pressure threshold that's been established above which the risk of that hemorrhage increases. Yeah. But there was like a case series where like a bunch of people, they just hemorrhage from like walking. So, <laughs> so, so, it seems, so it seems that it's not that, that the threshold is not very high mm. uh, to precipitate that. So diabetics with uh, proliferative retinopathy would be a population that would need some special consideration. Um, and then I think the other one, and this was one that I had to include at the request of the editors uh, up to date. They wanted me to talk about resistance training in the setting of back pain and disc issues, which is a okay. whole, whole separate topic. Yeah, and that's that, that's a whole thing. And I had to battle with them a little bit because there was a lot of you know, the, the biomedical thinking versus, as you know, like the biopsychosocial stuff that's much more complex mm. here um, in the setting of back pain. You know, if I wanted to simplify it, I would say, yeah, people with active uh, neurological deficits, particularly motor deficits, um, uh, uh, then those are situations, obviously, that are considered emergencies, and you're not going to be going to squat that day if you can't move your leg. Um, but for patients who just have either localized back pain, and even I've trained, I won't necessarily put out this recommendation to the internet, but I've tra- personally coached many people who have just the just um, sensory symptoms, meaning like a little bit of quote unquote sciatica, and they yeah. can usually train fine. Um, but you know, and this is all in the absence of the so-called red flag signs uh, for for back pain. 
Yeah, th- that's perfect, Austin. I think that whole general area, there's a lot of food for thought and I think a lot of great takeaways that professionals can take and consider from that. Sure. Another area I'd like to get into is what you just mentioned there is this whole general concept of pain and more specifically the biopsychosocial model of pain. So that sounds like a big fancy term, first of all, and be certainly intimidating for people. So could you just give us a bit of background as to what that um, bi- biopsychosocial model of pain actually means? Yeah, so, so it's basically a model through which we can view uh, the patient, and it applies to a number of different symptom presentations besides just pain as well, but we use it the most when we're talking about pain. And it really does the best job at explaining the common patient experience when it comes to pain. And the reason why is because it accounts for biological factors, and biological factors would be those including things like you know acute trauma, acute inflammation, uh, you know, the the role of nociception in the experience of pain, things like that. Uh, It accounts for psychological factors, and these are things that I'm particularly interested in, things like uh, fear, uh, fear avoidance behavior, catastrophizing, uh, and and things like that. And finally, it accounts for the social experience of pain. So so this is uh, one that's really under-recognized for sure. Um, And and I've talked about this a bit uh, elsewhere recently as well, where the idea is that you know, we are all humans just kind of walking around with incomplete experience of the world, and we can't experience every possible scenario, every possible thing. So we do the best we can. Our brains try to predict a lot of things, and in order to make our best prediction, we're constantly taking cues from our environment. We're taking Mm -hmm. these cues throughout our life. From the day we're born till the day we die, we are learning from observing other people's experience. We're taking in information from people who we trust, things like that. And all of those can actually influence our own interpretation of our symptoms. And because all these symptoms uh, come from the brain, uh, then it influences what we feel. And so this is some, that's another just super, super interesting area in so far as like what your experience is as a child, if you experience pain as a child, how your parents dealt with it, uh, how you observed your parents dealing with pain, how you observe others around you dealing with pain, um, and, uh, and how you interact with healthcare professionals, uh, basically, you take cues and you learn from others how to respond to these symptoms. And so that's kind of the best way to summarize the model is that it accounts for the biological factors, psychological factors, and social factors. And it can be applied to pain. I recently applied it to a discussion of fatigue. Um, lots and lots and lots of different things. That's brilliant. Um, I think we might get into fatigue in a little while, but if we stick with the concept of pain now, and if we view pain through this model, what would you say are maybe the biggest misconceptions or the biggest wrongly held common beliefs we see out there in towards pain in the modern um, society yeah I I think that when we talk about this model we typically contrast it with the more traditional biomedical model Mm. and when I say traditional this is not to say that the biopsychosocial model is new it was discussed like as far back as like the 50s 60s and 70s Um, and so it's been around for a long time but it's just been difficult to get it to, to take um, among many among many practitioners and so I think when it comes to pain the biggest misconception is that um, pain is something that provides an accurate reflection of the state of your tissues mm-hmm. um, that's probably one of the biggest uh, misconceptions is that if something hurts something must be wrong with your tissues at the site of pain mm-hmm. um, and people talk about things like pain receptors and pain fibers and pain pathways and all these things and all of these things are wrong um, in terms of how pain works. And so uh, when I, I we, we teach seminars and I give like a two to three hour lecture on this stuff um, where I basically try to get the point across that uh, pain is, a, is an evolutionarily conserved protective mechanism. It is the reason why we are still here among others, kind of like hunger, you know, sex, things like that, that we are, that we, that have been conserved throughout evolutionary history. Because, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, the genetic syndromes like congenital insensitivity to pain, they die early because they <laughs> injure themselves and they don't know what's going on. Right? Yeah. So, so it serves a useful purpose. So I try to reframe pain as this beneficial protective mechanism that we have uh, that is produced by our brain in response to a perception of threat or danger in the periphery. It does not come from the periphery. It does not tell you what's going on in the periphery. It is solely uh, an output of your brain uh, that is intended to cause you to protect a particular area. And so... In the most acute phase of an injury, when you immediately hurt yourself, um, that's probably when it is the most accurate uh, insofar as it's telling you something's up with your tissues, right? You have this acute nociceptive stimulus, 
uh, usually out somewhere like you just burned your hand or you just, you know, accidentally cut the tip of your finger off or whatever. However you injured yourself, your brain senses that, says, oh, I need to protect that area, and you do so. Um, but the longer pain sticks around, the, the, the more vague and not, uh, you know, productive or protective this mechanism becomes. And the longer it sticks around, the more a lot of these other psychosocial factors start to play a role in terms of, you know, fear and catastrophizing, and, you know, uh, which to define it for people who aren't familiar with it is just kind of worst case scenario thinking. People mm -hmm. who are assuming that whatever they're feeling has got to be the worst thing in the world. All that kind of stuff, because pain starts in the brain um, in response to these things, can influence people's perception of symptoms. Uh, and so... Yeah, that's probably the, the, some of the biggest sets of misconceptions that I try to clear up is that it's not an accurate reflection of the state of your tissues. It is a protective mechanism. It's there to help you. Um, and yeah, that's brilliant. I, and I really like that general idea that it's it's the brain driving the feeling we or the sensation we get in the periphery rather than the other way around i think one of the great examples we see of that maybe you'd like to discuss it is the role of placebo or in particular some of the in research i personally find intriguing is some of the research around sham surgeries and its effect on pain yeah so so sham controlled trials are like my favorite kind of science <laughs> primarily i think that's probably biased because i am an internist and not a surgeon i would probably yeah. not be as happy about them <laughs> if i was a surgeon uh unless i really wanted to be intellectually honest about this stuff mm. but yeah sham controlled surgeries are fascinating and it's fascinating to me that they ever in the first place started to get allowed through like IOD, <laughs> so we, we saw the value of them right like you're going to put this yeah. patient under anesthesia and expose them to the risks of this stuff and then pretend to do surgery on it. But yeah, that's what, that's what they do. So, you know, the best examples are those related to, uh, related to usually with arthroscopic surgery is the one that's pointed out as having the broadest evidence in space. Although we're starting to do sham control trials in tons of other conditions now as well, um, where they'll, you know, somebody has, you know, their, their knee hurts and, and some doctor ordered an MRI and it showed like a degenerative meniscal tear. <laughs> Uh, and they said, oh, I need to go in and, and trim it up. And so this is something that used to happen all the time. Um, and, and so they, they did the sham control trials, put the patient under anesthesia, poke the little holes in the knee, get their cameras in there. One group got their meniscus trimmed down. The other one got effectively nothing, pulled the scopes out, wake them up, and uh, the outcomes were the same. Yeah. Um, and so now that procedure has fallen completely out of favor. It's now recommended against by orthopedic guidelines to perform arthroscopic meniscal interventions in patients with degenerative meniscal tears. Um, so that's something that's now, fortunately, I, I can't say it's not being done anymore. It's just being done way, way, way less. Mm. Um, we're doing, we're seeing some similar uh, findings on uh, various orthopedic surgeries, some related to the shoulder, related to rotator cuff tendon, rotator cuff disease, for example, quote unquote disease, if we want to call it that, yeah. uh, back, uh, spine, spine issues, spine fusions, things like that. And so really, it's in, if, if in the biomedical model, if you view things through that kind of traditional biomedical, uh, medical model findings would make any sense mm. right because you're like well the pain is coming from the meniscus and i traded the <laughs> meniscus away so why is the pain still there or you go you know you, you do a total knee replacement on somebody and 20 to 25 percent of the patients post-op still have knee pain and you're like but your knee's gone we have this new beautiful fancy expensive prosthesis in there so you shouldn't have pain anymore but if you view it in the context of the biopsychosocial model where you can see oh the, these patients uh you know who went into surgery and came out still having pain they had depression, they had history of substance abuse issues, maybe they were sexually abused as a child, they had high levels of fear avoidance behavior, they had catastrophizing issues, they scored high on pain catastrophizing scales, they didn't do much exercise, they had low self-efficacy, low confidence, uh, poor social support, all these other things that influence people's, you know, just the way they live their lives and therefore their symptoms. Uh, and so it makes way more sense this way um, now, and we're starting to see, again, evidence pile up on this kind of thing. Yeah, it really is fascinating. And like yourself, I find that whole area of research quite, quite interesting. And I think one of the other areas then that probably for practitioners, they should maybe self audit and think about is how significant do you view the language we use when we're talking to either um, athletes or patients about their injuries and about their pain? of the psychological and the social factors uh, influencing people's symptoms, um, it makes complete sense that the way we talk to our patients can have huge, huge influence on their symptoms. And so there's evidence on this as well. 
Um, there was a survey study of patients, I think it was in Australia, a group of patients with back pain, and uh, overwhelmingly the patients viewed their backs as uh, you know, mechanical structures like a machine that were broken, that uh, this, this set of symptoms was very negative and was unlikely to get better. And they asked these patients, well, where did you get these ideas from? And 89% of the patients in the study said that they had learned these ideas from healthcare professionals. Um, and so this is something, that finding, I try to tell everybody I can about this stuff because, because I'm like, you do not understand because you are the person sitting there in a position of authority talking to your patients, the, the way that they can latch on to your words sometimes. So just a phrase, um, you know, where you tell somebody you have degenerative disc disease. To us, that's like a phrase that we see on x-rays all the time or MRIs, and we're like, you know, it's expected. We know basically in our minds that it's expected age-related findings that are super common and not particularly significant in most cases. But you tell a patient who doesn't have medical training, who doesn't know the epidemiology of this stuff, who doesn't know how pain works, you tell them the word degenerating. You tell them that their body is degenerating. That alters their whole view of themselves, how they act, how they behave. They become afraid to bend over, afraid to do activity. If they feel a little bit of back pain, because almost everybody on earth experiences back pain at some point, all of a sudden it gets latched onto that diagnosis. It's like, oh, that must be because I'm degenerating and my spine is frail and fragile. Um, and so it has this huge cascade of effects. And so there are a few really important papers that I would direct uh, practitioners to. Uh, one is called, I think it was in JAMA, it was called the, the iatrogenic effect of the physician's words or something along those lines. Um, there was a more recent one that was actually just, I think it was actually the iatrogenic potential of the physician's words. I have it on my desktop here, actually. Uh, <laughs> another one uh, that was just published this past week, uh, the title of it started with Sticks and Stones, like their little you know catchphrase in their title, and it had something to do with the use of language and musculoskeletal rehabilitation. Um, and there's lots and lots of papers uh, related to this stuff um, that I think people need to pay attention to and uh, pay attention to uh, base two things. Basically, pay attention to what the language that the patients are using because they are telling you a lot of information with the words that they use because it tells you what is their understanding of their condition, what have they been told about it. You know, if I have a patient who comes in and they tell me, oh, doc, like I'm really worried about my back because I have degenerative disc disease, things like that, that tells me what they've been told, right? And so then I have to, I know that I have to modify those beliefs before I'm going to be able to make any progress with this person because they told me they're worried. They told me they think they're degenerating. And then I ask them, well, what are you worried about? And of course, they're worried that maybe they are worried they're going to be paralyzed. Maybe they're worried that they're never going to be able to, you know, lift weights again or exercise again or lift their grandkid again. All these fears that can affect people's symptoms. Um, so pay attention to the words that people are using. In addition, pay attention to the words that you're using with people. Um, you know, both. Uh, you know, couch the language in a way that makes things less threatening, less dangerous, uh, provide optimism, uh, promote what we call an internal locus of control, make the patient feel like they can be in control of their symptoms and they're not going to be reliant or dependent on somebody else to fix their symptoms for the rest of their lives, uh, promote self-efficacy and confidence. And that's really an effective way to improve outcomes in musculoskeletal rehabilitation in particular. Yeah, I think that's a really valuable lesson and I hope people do take that away and I think we could probably apply the same teachings into sport because I see it within trainers it can be very easy for trainers to off the cuff talk to athletes and say use words like scar tissue adhesions which we know or should know at this stage are bullshit terms anyway but it, by using these type of terms flippantly an athlete can because we all associate scars with something that is a symbol of damage and cannot be healed adhesion right. something uh, drastic so how important do you see it in the terms of coaching to maybe not catastrophize or to use appropriate language can it have the same detrimental effect effects for athletes in a coaching context yes it absolutely does uh, this is something that i've probably you know uh, paid more increasing attention to in my own coaching practice and have taught a lot of my uh, colleagues about to try to get them to change their coaching practices as well and uh, to pay attention to the language that their clients use, because this is not in a clinical context in the office setting. But you know, if I'm if I have one of my remote coaching clients, for example, and they text me and they tell me I, that they just tweaked their back in the gym, right? Because that happens to everybody. Everybody's mm. you know felt something pop, and then it immediately stiffens up, and then they feel like they can't walk, right? Yeah. <laughs> there, are two, there are two possible paths that you can take after you tweak your back. Number one is that you can freak out. 
you can assume that you just blew out a disk, right? That's a mm. phrase that I consider to be evidence of catastrophizing. That they just fractured a vertebrae, that they just dislocated a, that they just dislocated something. That you know any number of wacky things that isn't actually what's going on, mm. but that's what you think. And they're like, I felt something slip. That had to be my disc. I'm like, no, <laughs> your <laughs> symptoms are unreliable. <laughs> uh, so so uh, so paying attention to how how they react in these situations, and then additionally paying attention to how you react. So if you're the coach and you you start freaking out and you're like, oh my god, you need to get to the ER right away and all this kind of stuff, that can worsen that can worsen their 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 pain, uh, their experience, their their time to recovery, um, and it makes them puts them in a worse position the next time something like this happens. Because if you train mm-hmm. long enough, this kind of thing is going to happen. So the next time. You know, what's their prior experience that they have to draw on now? This whole negative experience they had in the past. Uh, so instead, uh, almost all acute injuries that I have uh, deal with with my clients, uh, immediately my step one is tell them to don't panic. Don't freak out. Uh, calm yourself down. Because the more you allow yourself to get wound up, the more fear there is, uh, the more your brain thinks that it needs to protect that area, the more pain it's going to generate uh, in that area uh, to motivate you to protect it. And so I have to try to break that cycle. I have to try to break that fear, uh, get people to feel like it's they're going to be okay. And the way we do that is both with psychological techniques, uh, you know, uh, talking about having them pay attention to the way they're thinking about things. Um, and then additionally with uh, uh, movement to teach them that. So, so in other words, uh, you know, if I tweak my back, uh, the first thing I do myself is, definitely not freak out at this point i can manage to stay pretty stoic about it and then the next thing is to just start moving around in the gym even if it really hurts the first few reps to like you know bend over as if i'm going to set up for a deadlift i do it a few times in a row and i notice that a little bit more range of motion a little bit more range of motion a little bit more range of motion and before i know it i'm moving around fairly comfortably now if i stop moving and then i feel things stiffen up again and i just repeat the process but that Mm -hmm. process is teaching me teaching my brain that hey things are okay you're all right you're gonna be able to move and almost always, you know, particularly with younger trainees, uh, this process can get people after a back tweak, even if it's a fairly severe one, back to training pretty normally in under a week. Usually in about 72 hours, they're feeling back to normal. Um, and, and, you know, that's, of course, just, you know, your mileage might, may vary. It's not going to apply to everybody. I don't want to put out, be put out like quack sounding, you know, extraordinary claims. <laughs> But the idea is that in this, you know, the overwhelming, you know, catastrophic injuries in the gym are very rare. And so if you just want to play your odds that things are probably okay, they probably are, right? Mm. Now, if you have a leg that's frankly paralyzed, you know, then yeah, you need to go to an yeah. ER. But I have never seen that happen. I've never coached anybody that's happened to where they have, you know, such an acute, massive disc herniation that they end up with, you know, complete leg paralysis mm. or something and need to go to the OR. Never seen it happen. So odds are you're fine, so you need to work on your brain, calm yourself down, and then work on your body and keep moving. Um, and so the way that both athletes respond and their coaches respond and the language that's exchanged between them says a lot about what's going on. So that's where we have the potential to modify things. Definitely, and I think that's an area that any lifter for of any decent level of experience or training age will certainly relate to, and I think we've all been there. And it is very easy to fall into that kind of worst-case scenario mind frame. And that, that's with injuries, with tweaks. But one area that you mentioned before we came on air that I think would be interesting to expand on is the whole idea of catastrophizing fatigue. Do you think that's something that can can happen? Or where is the kind of dangers or traps we can fall into when it comes to training fatigue and this kind of whole uh, model? Yeah, so this is something I recently have been thinking about and wrote, and wrote a piece about on our website. And, and kind of you can apply the same kind of biopsychosocial model to it, right? So there are obviously biological mechanisms of fatigue there are the you know the metabolic issues there's you know like eccentric induced muscle damage all this other kind of stuff that contributes to uh you know decrements in muscular force production either in the set in the court you know throughout a given set or between sets or across training sessions things like that um but there are also a number of um uh psychological components to fatigue because fatigue i i i've not seen this necessarily uh argued a lot elsewhere, but it seems plausible enough to me that in the same way that pain is a symptom that's generated by your brain to protect you, fatigue could be something similar. It could be something that's generated by your brain to 
you know, prevent you from killing yourself from exertion. I don't know. <laughs> it, it, you know, in combination with the peripheral biological effects, you know, people mm. talk about central and peripheral fatigue and stuff like that. But um, so there are definitely psychological components to it. Um, and an interesting paper on this, uh, since people are probably going to be interested in the reading list here, is a paper titled uh, uh, Translating Fatigue to Human Performance, I think is the title of the article. Mm. Uh, it's open access, free, uh, free full text that you can, that you can find. Uh, on PubMed, so so they, they have a nice diagram and they lay out the biological components and the and the psychological components, and, and they describe them in terms of, uh, of performance fatigability and uh, perceived fatigability, and so there's this perception aspect to it. It's what you're perceiving about your performance and how you're feeling and your level of fatigue and how much longer you can go on, um, and this interestingly ties into the psychobiological model of endurance performance. So there's this whole model that basically it's arguably incomplete, but it argues that like, you know, in an endurance task, if you're running a marathon, um, your performance is just going to be limited by, you know, at what point does the amount of effort required to keep going surpass how much effort you're willing to put forth. As soon as that passes, that passes it, you stop running. <laughs> but yeah. as long as you're willing to put forth more effort than is required, then you can keep going, right? So, yeah. so there's this psychological component um, to fatigue. And so, uh, you know, our perceptions of fatigue similarly can be influenced by our thoughts and beliefs about fatigue. So if you have, are the type of person who historically, you know, oh, and, and also through our interactions with others, including coaches, people who respect, you know, the veteran lifter in the gym that you take advice from, all these kind of people, that's the social learning side of things. And so, you know, if all you've ever been taught once from the day you started training is you know that you need to you know beware the overtraining boogeyman like you, no. you know you don't want to do you don't want to do too much or you're gonna wreck yourself you're gonna destroy yourself you're gonna you know you're, you're gonna break uh you know things like that those are all a catastrophic type language to describe uh the effects of training and overtraining in the setting of uh you know average joe resistance training going to the gym three or four times a week doesn't really happen uh, you know, true endur true overtraining syndrome, the majority of the data on this is in the endurance literature. These yeah. are like the ultra marathoners, you know, training, you know, multiple times a day, huge, huge, huge training volumes. You know, if you're somebody who's going to the gym three times a week and doing, you know, three sets of five on the squat, like you are not <laughs> overtraining. Um, but if, you, if everything you've ever been told is that you need to, is that, you know, fatigue, uh, is a sign that you're approaching overtraining if you're feeling poorly, if you're sore, you're stiff, whatever. Those are all subjective symptoms that can get magnified by uh, psychological factors and social factors, uh, your pre-existing beliefs about these things. And so to the extent that someone is fearful of these things, that they interpret uh, them negatively, uh, which there's also evidence on this, you know, uh, in terms of um, how much uh, muscular soreness impairs people's function, uh, results in worsening strength performance, stuff like that has been correlated to like fear of soreness, things like mm -hmm. that. Um, then, then that all plays a significant role. And so I try to do the same thing with my lifters. I try to get them to, you know, basically to reframe the whole situation that we are not afraid of fatigue, that fatigue is a necessary part of training. It's something that we should expect. Um, and it's something that's going to contribute towards the adaptations that we're looking for and intelligent programming should manage fatigue intelligently. Uh, I will not allow you to overtrain, you're going to be fine, things like that. Um, and, and so rather than being obsessed with fatigue and recovery and being afraid of overtraining, which can limit people's outcomes because they won't train enough, I reframe it into a productive thing where they are willing and interested to push through it a little bit as long as fatigue is managed through the programming and they train more and they get better outcomes because training has this dose response effect. You train more, you get better. So yeah, that's kind of the summary of my thoughts on that. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Even anecdotally, what I've heard some interesting conversations around recently at Top Up myself is the role, as you said, of perception in fatigue. Because a lot of time we see, even from an anecdotal perspective, lower body sessions versus upper body sessions that even when lower body sessions are relatively say low to moderate volume people will often report much more fatigue than even a high volume upper body session afterwards from just how they generally feel and a certain amount of that obviously we can make the argument between absolute loading and tonnages and all this kind of thing but we do see a general perception of people just when they're entering into a lower body dominant session they just before they even begin the session they're already expecting it to wipe them and afterwards they're expecting to be highly fatigued so whether it's kind of um 
a self-fulfilling prophecy or what that it's just an interesting concept to kind of trash out yeah there's probably a combination of some biological factors there mm. or you know you can talk about the absolute loading like you said and all that kind of stuff but there's definitely some expectancy type effects mm. there you know like when i when i started training you know doing doing a you know a novice type program a lot of times they'll just have you deadlift like once a week because yeah. deadlifting you know quote unquote fries your cns which yeah. isn't a thing that happens you know yeah. so you know and now i look back at, at you know and how much I have to train my deadlift now to make it keep going up, and I'm pulling, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 reps of, of pulling in some fashion from the floor a week and recovering fine, weights are going up. And, uh, you know, if I had maintained that belief that deadlifting more than one heavy set a week, uh, you know, will destroy you or is counterproductive or is unproductive, then I would have never made it as far as I did. Mm. Yeah, and it's it's an interesting concept, and it's one that I do look forward to see develop and being kind of discussed more. Hopefully, going forward. So we're coming up on time, Austin. And before I ask you the final question, um, this conversation is absolutely fantastic. So if people are looking to read more about this or follow your work or get in contact with you, where are the best places to do that? Uh, yeah. So so uh, probably through the Barbell Medicine website. We have a website with articles and we have forums there. Uh, Instagram, I'm uh, Austin underscore Barbell Medicine on Twitter, um, which I don't do tons of interacting on Twitter. That's a lot of where I find, you know, papers and research yeah. and retweet it and stuff like that. It's just my name, Austin Baraki. Um, and yeah, those are probably the main places that people can, can find find our stuff. And we have a we have a Facebook group called Barbell Medicine, all kinds of things like that. So it's pretty easy to find. Perfect. And I do encourage everyone to go check those out there. Great resources. So the final question is the one that everyone gets asked, Austin, and interested to hear your perspective on this. What would you say is the biggest mistake you've made or the biggest learning experience you've had that has changed the way you've either approached your career or your mindset as a whole? So the answer to this doesn't need to be directly related to training or to your career. It can be whatever spin you like to take on this. One of my favorite uh, podcasts that my audience knows that I that I like to listen to and spread is is the You Are Not So Smart podcast. <laughs> so would recommend people listen to that. Um, and it basically uh, elucidates over the course of many many episodes all of the different ways by which we delude ourselves on a daily basis. And I think that probably the biggest mistake that that I've made is. You know, over the course of my you know training, coaching, career development as a as a human, is just like anybody else falling prey to a number of uh, of those things. Um, they talk about you know critical thinking, rational thinking, the role you know how emotional uh, emotionality uh, in the setting of like arguments can preclude rational thinking. Tribalism is something they talk about a lot. Uh, basically, you know tying your personal identity into some of your beliefs and making them really in, in, you know, not extricable from your identity so that it makes it impossible for you to really objectively analyze things and change your mind. Changing your mind about things becomes like, you know, this, this, this attack on your individual identity. So, so things like that, um, it's like a whole category. I can't really point to one, but, mm. but all the ways that people routinely delude themselves. Uh, and so I think that that would probably be the thing that I would encourage people to do the most is to learn about those and so that you can pay attention to the way that you think and act and behave and alter that when you can identify those things. Um, one of my favorite concepts that I uh, talk about a lot, teach a lot, um, is, is metacognition, just yeah. referring to thinking about your own thinking. And the reason why is because it's applicable in this situation, just kind of the way you carry yourself and think and respond to things in daily life, it's applicable to uh to things like pain right because we talked about paying attention to how you're responding to stuff and how you're thinking about it uh it's just applicable in so many situations to where uh, it's really i think a a a useful mature way of of thinking and 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 living that will allow you to get closer to the truth rather than to be kind of held back by uh biases or logical fallacies or errors in thinking and, and things like that so that would be that would probably be it that's a, a terrific answer and one that people can certainly take a lot of advice from because I think, as you said, that metacognition, this thinking about our own thinking is very important and something that we all should do from time to time because it is very easy to fall into these traps and there's yeah. all of us do on quite probably much more regular basis than we even can realize ourselves yes. we do fall into these traps. 
So it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Stephen Austin. I think I've taken a lot of value from this conversation. I know the listeners will too. So thank you so much for giving up your time and having a conversation this evening.